This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It's because of Mother Nature, but we've actually got ourselves a pretty fun day of baseball on tap for today. We've got Game 5 between the Guardians and the Yankees. Game 1 between the Padres and the Phillies as well. We're going to break it down with Rob Friedman, Pitching Ninja, getting his read on both those games and talking about the NLDS, or NLCS in general. And I'll get my first look at Week number 7 in the NFL. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sadas. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here once again by Rob Friedman. Check out his work over on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find him on MLB, Peacock, Fox, Nesson, wherever you're consuming baseball. Rob is probably there. And Rob, fun day of baseball on tap. How are you doing today? I am doing well. I'm well rested. There was no yeah. baseball yesterday, so I'm I'm ready. My fingers are ready. My, I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah I feel like yeah. you got to rest those up, uh, get those all set. I, I don't know what my stats are on one day's rest, but uh, <laughs> I think they're pretty good. We're going to talk about that. So I'm going to talk about that, that Yankees Guardians game. It's a pretty fun setup uh, for that one. A lot of interesting dynamics at play. Like I said, we'll talk about ML, uh, NFL week seven later on. We'll talk about uh recap last week as well. But first, let's start things off with game five Guardians at Yankees. Nestor Cortez starting on short rest here for the for the Yankees. Aaron Savalli in line to start for the Guardians. Sounds like Shane Bieber probably we're probably going to see him at some point um, for tonight. I want to ask you about the Guardians in a second, but first, Nestor Cortez on short rest. He seemed like he changed his approach a bit in that first playoff game, kind of reverting back to, it seemed to me at least, some of the stuff he was doing earlier on this year when he was more effective. What did you see in that first start from Cortez, and what do you think that translates to tonight on short rest? You know, I, I'm I, for one, I'm not worried about him on, on short rest as much as I would be about Bieber. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, number one, it's it's an elimination game. Like, you got to yeah. bring your best. And and adrenaline overcomes a lot of stuff. Um, you know, he's not a guy that relies on velo. He relies on craftiness. Yeah. And uh, so I kind of like that. I thought the the first game, a lot of elevated cutters, um, which is an effective pitch for him. That that cutter is a, is a nasty pitch. Not a lot of um, <clears throat> messing with timing and stuff, which is – you know, who knows? Maybe he'll do a little bit more of that because stuff might be a tiny bit down on a little bit less rest, but I'm not expecting it to have a big impact on him. He'll be good. I think the other thing, too, with that is you're seeing a team for the second time in a couple of days. Now, I worry about this a lot when I'm betting in season where it's a pitcher's second consecutive start against the exact same team. I worry about that. Do you think that with Cortez, because he can change things up so much, it better positions him to handle that kind of adverse uh, adverse situation? That would be my instinct on it. You okay. know, I, again, I don't have numbers to back it up, but yeah. I do know that his variable arm slots, as well as his just messing with timing in general and craftiness, he's less predictable. So I, yeah. I think you have a hard time, like a, a, a cutter at, at a lower arm slot or a curveball at a lower arm slot or even a, you know, a sinker or whatever it's going to react differently than, than up here. And he can do that. He can make multiple pitches out of one pitch. So I kind of like that. I I expect to see him do that a little more and be a little craftier being at home, you know, having to have an environment that uh, encourages that. I think should be fun for sure. So that's the Yankee side of things. Let's talk about the guardian side here because I got to admit, Rob, I did bet the Guardians both last night and then when it reopened today uh, with the reopened odds. And part of the reason why I felt OK with betting the Guardians was because I think Aaron Savali is better than the results showed down the stretch. So I think he'll be effective when he's out there. But also having Shane Bieber waiting to fire that sick, sick bullpen behind them, I feel like we're going to see a low scoring game and low scoring games tend to be a bit more chaotic. So if I can get plus 152 on the on the Guardians, which I can't right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, I think that's a good situation. But I want to ask you, if, if you're Terry Francona, how are you handling this situation where you actually do have pretty good options no matter what you want to do at your disposal? To me, Savali is one of the most underrated pitchers, especially when you look at you look at his season stats and you're like, the hell, that, that blows. <laughs> and, but if you look at the last three months, He's been really good, and he had a 10K game, mostly on curveballs. I think they might have been all curveballs that game. Mm-hmm. His curveball is one of the best curveballs in the major leagues, and and the stats back that up. So 
I wouldn't be like I, I I wouldn't sleep on him and think that you're getting the guy with these inflated stats. He's a competitor and has really good stuff. I think they would like to not pitch Bieber if they yeah. can, only because you know Bieber has been outstanding this year. No doubt, you know, one of the top pitchers in the league. He doesn't rely on Velo this year, mostly because his Velo is down because of his shoulder struggles. And I don't think they want to encourage that. Like I think sure. they, he, to me, he is a little bit more uh, somebody I would protect. That doesn't mean he won't get in the game, and it doesn't mean he doesn't want to get in the game. I know he wants to get in. Freaking Garrett Cole said he would pitch on, on you know, basically zero coming after rest. A, a zero a couple days hours rest. rest. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? He will because he's a competitor and he wants to win. And I think it sends a message to the team, it sends mm -hmm. a message to both teams. If Bieber, you know, Bieber absolutely is available, will he pitch? Depends on the situation. I think they're going to ride Savali for, for as long as they can, hopefully bridge him to their bullpen. You're right. That's wet rested. Ton of great arms there. And you top it off with arguably the best closer in baseball. I would say Diaz is the best closer, but Class A is at worst one B. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can get him, I mean, maybe even two innings out of him and you got Karen check and you got Stefan. I mean, they're, they're loaded in their bullpen and you're right. It's a crap shoot. They could win. Yeah. yeah. So Valley, after he came back the first time uh, from, well, I guess the second time, I don't, he had a lot of injuries this year. The, the first, he, when he came back in August, his curveball usage from then on 29.7% up from 27.5% overall that game against Detroit, you referenced 43.9%. I'm guessing if it's a must win situation, they're probably going to let that thing cook if it's if it's working. And I feel like that's why I have some faith in him personally. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't watched him pitch this year, that dude's curveball is it's pretty and it's a hammer like it, it is a it is a high spin rate hammer. And I would just keep going to it like if that's working, keep going to that. You don't have the luxury of, of saying, let's wait it out and see what's going to happen the sec second time through. You're going to go at it with your best pitches. You're going to see a lot of curveballs is my guess. Yeah, and hopefully I can uh, that can lead to the Guardians to victory because I need that ticket to cash. So we'll see what the Guardians can do <laughs> in this one. Let's now talk about the NLDS or NLCS because we've got uh, I keep saying NLDS or something. I have a problem with that too. There's all these NL blah blah blah. Right? There's yeah. too many things going yeah, on. Yeah. Today we get the Phillies at the Padres for game number one. Zach Wheeler going up against you, Darvish, and we've seen both these guys twice in the playoffs. What have you seen? from them in the playoffs so far and who do you think has the edge in this matchup for game one yeah i mean they're both really really good pitchers for one and i've seen them at the top of their game um darvish you know with all his weapons it doesn't matter how many times you see him mm -hmm. when a dude's got 12 different pitches he can mix it up <laughs> however he wants to he also will mess with timing every once in a while too like he's a crafty veteran that has he throws hard too like he you know he's be 95 97 wheeler obviously has has great velo sharp stuff i thought he's looked really good i expect it to be a low scoring game you know this is my type of pitching matchup where you have two top tier pitchers aces going at each other and uh you know against two good lineups too these are quality teams i know everybody's looking at it going boy shocker every you know you have the braves and the dodgers out of it the mets not there Look at these teams, and you can see like the rise of their bullpens at the end of the year. I mean, you have Alvarado, who's been just freaking lights out. You have Hater that's come back from the dead and now is as dominant Hater again. Um, you know, these teams didn't get there by luck. They're good teams. So this should be a fun series. I expect today to be a pitcher's duel. I'm hoping it's a pitcher's duel. Matter of, I mean, I picked it to be a pitcher's duel today. I have uh Wheeler, I think, for, for 5Ks and Darvish for 6Ks. Wouldn't be surprised to see Darvish get a little more than that. But, yeah, I mean, I expect it to be a, a, a pitcher's duel, which means it probably won't be, and I'll <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, because I like these two guys a lot. Uh, Darvish and Wheeler, two of my favorite pitchers to watch. Total in this game is seven runs right now. Under is minus 122. So they are expecting a pitcher's duel as well, but also, like, I get it. I think that that is the way I lean here. And it, it is not just the, the starters. You mentioned the bullpens too. I have like these horrible flashbacks of the Phillies. I had their money line in like May or June. They were up like nine, nothing. And they lost. And like, I keep thinking about that. But when you look at the, the data behind their bullpen now, it seems very different. Who has the edge at the back end for this series? It, that is a super question because I Agree with you 1000%. The Phillies knock has always been their bullpen. Yeah. And instead now 
I arguably it's a strength of theirs. I mean, yeah. moving Eflin back there was useful, but Sir Anthony Dominguez legit could close for a ton of teams. I mean, hundred mile an hour fastball, um, just nasty stuff. And then Alvarado has his K rate is through the roof. And you know, it's tough. Like, I don't know. I don't know who has the edge. I would normally say the Padres, right? Because um, the Padres have filth in their bullpen as well, but it's close. I mean, this is a close series, I think. I think it is too. And that should means it should be a fun series as well. I'm excited to sit back, just enjoy some baseball, both with game five and with game one of the NLCS for today. That is Rob Friedman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find his work at Fox, MLB, Peacock, and Nesson. Rob, enjoy the baseball for today. Enjoy game five and game one. Uh, hopefully they uh, you can rest up those fingers and uh, be good on extended rest for today. Good luck. They're, they're so ready. I am ready right. for this. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. We'll talk to you again soon. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. That was Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Once again, check out his work at Fox, MLB, Peacock, and Ness. And we'll dive into NFL week number seven here in just one second. But first, don't forget to subscribe to the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Wherever you get your podcast, we have daily shows here every weekday. We have uh, Monday Night Football previews. We've got these Tuesday shows, the first look, college football on Wednesdays, NFL Thursday, and then a player prop show on Friday as well. Get all that by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can find all these shows up on the FanDuel YouTube page in full after the fact. Twisted T and FanDuel have joined forces to bring you a one-of-a-kind contest series that gives you a chance to compete for your share of thousands of dollars in site credit. Introducing Twisted T's College Football Picks, a sports betting-focused contest series that's entirely free to play. The contest is simple. Each college football game will be assigned money lines, spread, and total markets with assigned points to each market. All you have to do is make six selections based on those three markets and earn points for each correct selection you made. If at the end of the day, your score ranks among the best in the contest, you'll be eligible for your share of site credit. Head to FanDuel.com slash Twisted T Picks and make your picks. And remember, please drink responsibly. Let's take a look here at week number seven in the NFL. And as we've talked about a lot here recently, I'm running two separate models right now, one of which is a traditional model, the model I use for betting uh, that blends priors with 2022 data, and then one that is just 2022 to kind of provide me a check of, am I reading things correctly? You know, kind of a second check to make sure I've got the right read on games. My traditional model, one I use for betting, has zero games showing at least two points of value for this week on the spread. So it's a very efficient market there. And the ones that are close uh, to, two, to two points make me pretty uncomfortable from a spread perspective. So last week, and we'll talk about this in the recap, I had no spread bets the entire week. I might wind up there once again. Instead, I'll be looking towards money lines and totals. On the money line side of things, I am showing at least two percentage points of value in five separate games. One of them is Denver at minus 142 against the Jets. I have been here at Denver plenty of times before, and they bother the heck out of me. Last night, I could not tell you how many times I got like anxiety looking at Denver because I thought that I had to bet on them because I'm just so used to have being anxious while watching them, and I didn't. That was very nice to remember. Okay, you don't have to worry about this. This is fine. That's one part. That's one part of why I'm hesitant to bet Denver at minus 142. The other one is that my 2022 only model, which has no priors in it and does not view the Jets as being a, as trashy as uh, maybe the other one does, it's actually showing value on the Jets at plus three. So I'm pretty torn on this. I'm staying away, I think, uh, as of right now, because I'm sick of rooting for Denver and sweating their games. It's been not a fun experience. It is currently the biggest edge in my model for any game this week. But again, with the 2022 only model saying, I don't know about that. I And the overall sentiment that I've got around Denver, I think I'm staying away. If you want to go there at minus 142, my numbers say there's value. But personally, I have not made that bet. And if I had to guess, I don't think I will before Sunday either. The second one showing value for me is the Seahawks at plus 250 against the Chargers. There are still some sevens hanging out there from a spread perspective. So if you can get a seven, I'd probably take that. But I do like the money line at plus 250 as well. I've got Seattle's win odds around 33% and the implied odds at plus 250 are 29%. 
And the 33% win odds are in my traditional model, the one uh, that has a heavy prior on it. And that prior adores the Chargers. They were like a top five team for me preseason based on expectations going in, and they're frustrating. The 2022 only model likes Seattle even more. And I think that's for obvious reasons. The Chargers uh, get penalized there for how stupid they are in early downs. Like they are the most frustrating offense to watch of all time. Um, like just a maddening offense based on the way they bottle up a, a freakazoid quarterback. They refuse to let him show off those, those skills. So the 20, the, the blended model that I like says Seattle money line, the 2022 only model says Seattle money line. So I will take the Seahawks money line at plus two fifty. I'm fully okay. If you want to go plus seven, if you can get that as well. Um, I don't think we'll get back to seven. Most places have shifted to six and a half at this point. I don't think we'll get back to seven at any point. Um, so I would take that now. Uh, I personally, am going to go with the Seahawks money line plus two fifty, but plus seven also fully. Okay. If you can get that at six and a half right now over at FanDuel. The final money line where I've got value is in the 49ers at plus 134 against the Chiefs. I've got their win odds at 46% versus 43% implied. And my 2022 only model agrees with this one and thinking that there's value in the 49ers. I'm not betting this one right now because I want to see injury reports first. The injuries on the defensive side for the 49ers are pretty big. They missed a lot of guys last week. Trent Williams is still out, didn't play last week. And let's say I add in... The Trent Williams injury, if he, if he sits again this week or add in some others, I'm guessing it will shift the model to a point where the 49ers are no longer a value because it's pretty thin right now above my threshold of where I'm willing to bet it. If you take out some of those guys, they'll probably be either no value or slim enough value where I wouldn't bet it. So I'm not taking this one. Uh, the 49ers plus 134, I, 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 I will pass there. I'm also showing value on the uh, Pittsburgh with Kenny uh, Pittsburgh right now against Miami, but that's pending Kenny Pickett stuff. So I'm probably not going to take that one either. They're showing value, but I don't want the chance. He'll be ruled out that secondary. Also had a lot of guys missing this past week. Didn't matter against Tom Brady for some reason, but I think it will against Tua and uh, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle this week. So I am showing value on the 49ers and the Steelers. I'm not betting it because I think once injuries are added more so, those will no longer be values. So holding off there. So the only like spread or money line I have right now is Seattle plus 250 or plus seven if you can get that. And I'm probably going to stand pat, honestly. I, I would need something to move pretty drastically to buy in somewhere else. So it's a pretty light week for me there. There are two totals I like this week. One is actually in that Seattle Los Angeles game. I want under 51 and a half at minus 106. Both these defenses are not good, so that's concerning for sure, but I just don't have the projected efficiency high enough in this game to justify a 51.5 point total, which is the highest of the week. I think it should probably be closer down to like 48 or so, personally. I don't have a total model, and I want to make that abundantly clear. I'm betting this based off of projected efficiency, and there are a lot more things that go into it than just that one number, but Los Angeles lacks explosion on offense. That is better for unders than for overs. I think Seattle could skew more towards the run this week than they have been. They've actually been a pretty pass heavy team, which is kind of like an FU to Russell Wilson. It seems like, but I could see them being a bit more run heavy against Los Angeles than against other teams. So I like under 51 and a half at minus one Oh six there. The other, I kind of like is Tennessee Indy over 42 and a half. That's minus minus one ten at FanDuel. Now this is a repeat divisional matchup and those tend to be lower scoring, but based on research I've done, that tends to be more true when it involves a quarterback who is dependent on efficiency, Matt Ryan and Ryan Tannehill in 2022 are not dependent on efficiency. They're not that great. Neither of these quarterbacks likely to be efficient. Uh, Tennessee's defense just kind of stinks. I think based on what my numbers are saying in the last week, potentially due to the Jonathan Taylor injury went super, super pass heavy. And they could revert back from that with, if Taylor plays this week, but I think they could do it again, just based on the fact that their offensive line is banged up and they might not be able to run the ball super effectively. So I think the over here is the right way to go. So three bets for me early on this week. I got Seattle plus 250 or plus seven. If you want to go with the spread, I think that's totally okay. And you can find that there. I like that game to go under 51 and a half at minus 106. And I like the Titans Colts over 42 and a half at minus 110. And I think those will probably wind up being the full run out for me barring player props later on this week, barring some total movement and stuff like that. I think that 
those three are probably likely my only three for this week. So we'll get talk more about week number seven on Thursday in our preview show, and we'll break down uh, college football as well for tomorrow. But first, let's go back to last week and recap what we had in last week's show. On the college side of things, we had Ben Stevens of Sports Grid on to preview week seven. Find Ben on the morning after on Sports Grid. Check him out on Twitter at Ben Scott Stevens. He and Ed went head to head over Syracuse versus NC State. And- I mean, both guys got something here. Ed got the line movement, um, and Ben got the win. Ed had plus three and a half on NC State. Ben laid the three and a half with Syracuse, and this one closed the three. So line did move in Ed's favor to get to three, but Ben got the win. NC State made it a four-point game pretty late in that game, but Syracuse scored to go 17 to six, and they held on there to get the win. 24 to nine, the final score there. So Syracuse... Uh, getting a big win there now facing Clemson. We'll talk about that game, I'm sure, tomorrow on the college football side of things. And that did get the cover for Ben. Ben also talked about checking out rushing props for Mohamed, Mom Ibrahim, uh, uh, Mo Ibrahim and Chase Brown at Minnesota, Illinois game. Ibrahim, 127 yards on just 15 carries in a loss. And then Brown had 180. So nice little week for Ben. Uh, across the board there. He's a, a Syracuse alum, so got to enjoy that. Gets to enjoy this week's game as well. So check out Ben on Twitter at Ben Scott. Stevens will talk to Ed about week number eight on tomorrow's show. On the NFL side, I had a decent little week. I finished three and two despite having five money line underdogs as my recorded picks of the show. And I wasn't like seeking out uh, money line or underdog money lines because I don't want to seek out anything. I just want to go where the value is, but that's just where the value was last week. Happened to be on a lot of dogs. Uh, Those are the Chiefs at plus 130, Commanders plus 104, Seahawks plus 120, Cowboys plus 190, woof, and the Patriots at plus 130. The Pats one we talked about Tuesday. I said I was holding off until we got a better read on Mac Jones. And... He didn't wind up playing, but as I dug in, I realized that Bailey Zappi is actually playing pretty well. It might not matter too much. I got that one at plus 130. Um, It had gone to plus 122 at one point earlier in the week, and I got it at plus 130 after it sagged back a bit. I believe it closed around 122 or so. Um, Got that one because they did beat uh, the Patriots. The Commanders and Seahawks uh, were the two ones we talked about on Tuesday, so... Those two uh, from the Tuesday show wound up uh, going uh, two and two there, but both those are plus one money. Commander uh, plus money. The Commanders oh, were 104. We talked about them, closed at minus 112. Seahawks, I think, closed at 122, so actually lengthened a bit after we discussed them. No movement there, but both those teams did win to get me the, the profit there on Tuesday. Chiefs and Cowboys didn't. The Cowboys won, moved against me pretty badly. Uh, so likely a bad read on my part. Bad results, bad read, not the best combination, but definitely does happen. Um, the Chiefs won. They had a shot to win that game late. I don't feel bad about that one, honestly. It hung out. I, I mentioned it plus 130. I think it was around 124, 122, somewhere around close. So uh, the Cowboys won is bad, but I had a good week overall. I'll definitely take it and feel good about the process and the results from week number six. Tom Vecchio at DFS underscore Tom was on with me on Thursday and uh, on Monday night. Talk about that. Tom on Thursday had the Bengals at minus one, one and a half hit that one uh, against the Saints. He had the Vikings minus three and a half against the Dolphins hit that one as well. The one Missy at Thursday was the Jags money line at plus one twelve. They did get up early, uh, but couldn't hold things off. Just a, a rough couple of weeks here for the Jags. And interested to see what they do this week against the Giants. So uh, two and one on Thursday for Tom. And then last night, Tom had two bets. One was Justin Herbert over 35 and a half passing attempts at minus 108. And Mike Williams for any time touchdown at plus 125. Herbert had 57 attempts. He almost doubled up. His, well, not quite. That's an exaggeration. But like he went pretty well over his uh, passing attempt props. That one hit pretty easily. Mike Williams didn't do a whole lot. Uh, great coverage there from Patrick Sertan the second. So uh, one and one last night and three and two overall for Tom. A good week for him. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. And a reminder, we did talk about NBA opening night for tonight's two games on yesterday's show. If you want to check out that portion of the show, there is a timestamp for it in the episode description over on the Covering the Spread podcast feed and up on numberfire.com. Finally, we had JJ Zacharyson on uh, to talk about props. Check out JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB and check him out his work at LateRound.com and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. Hit his touchdown prop last week. That was Ramondre Stevenson at plus 105 at DK. Uh, that was a bad 
not a good number. Um, he should have been much shorter than that. So good hit by JJ there. Uh, Stevenson not only scored, but also just went nuts in general. So good week there for him. Zach Cat or uh, uh, I was thinking of Zach Ertz. JJ had Zach Ertz over 48 and a half receiving yards. Missed on James Robinson under 48 and a half. Uh, and Caleb Huntley under 26 and a half. Robinson's role got worse. So I think the process there was good. Huntley, uh, his role got better. So a uh, tough beat there is the, the Falcons kind of changed up their approach and had Huntley uh, featured a lot early on in that game. In situations to monitor, JJ talked about the declining roles of Leonard Fournette and Dalvin Cook. And both those guys said their snap rates go up a lot in week six. Uh, but Dalv still just 83 yards from scrimmage. So not super effective. The Vikings didn't have the ball at all. I guess that's the bigger part of it. So they never had the ball. So Cook could do a whole lot. Lenny did very well. Uh, but the Cook one depends on what number you got him at. The other one that we talked about uh, was Devin Singletary in tight scripts where JJ was saying, you know, the Bills are in tight games. They use Singletary more, keep him on the field more, and no touchdown for Singletary because that's not allowed in the Bills offense, never allowed to score. But uh, Singletary, 85 yards rushing, 22 receiving, likely hit on that one. So as always, uh, we're talking about these situations to monitor before the numbers are actually up. So it depends on what number you got, but I think the overall sentiment of buying into Devin Singletary, I think that probably worked out. Depends on the number with Dalv. Uh, the Lenny one did not work out, but do we get the Earths and the Ramondre ones from JJ? So overall, I think a pretty solid week for the show. Not like a banner week by any means, but decent week across the board. Profitable week for me, both with NFL and NASCAR. So feeling pretty good as we head to week seven. Unfortunately, not a lot of spots to take advantage, but either way, uh, still feeling pretty good about week number seven. That is all that we have here for today on covering the spread. As mentioned several times, we'll have our college football preview up probably tomorrow afternoon, sometime I would guess, with me and Ed Fang breaking down his read on week number eight, talking about that big Syracuse Clemson game and much more. We'll have our NFL week seven preview, the full preview coming up on Thursday and the prop preview coming up on Friday. To get all those as they are live, make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, Leave us a rating and review as well. Big thank you to Rob Friedman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja and check out all of his work there on MLB, uh, Fox, Peacock, and Nesson. Thank you to Rob as always. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. I hope that your week six went well for you. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to talk about some college football. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 